welcome to the DL, the podcast show that talks about everything to do with truck repair and diagnostics for the heavy truck and construction industry. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, CEO and founder of Diesel Laptops. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the DL. Today, I have someone here that's going to talk to everybody about something I find somewhat boring sometimes, but it's actually a really important part of business and has to do with insurance. And we're going to touch on a couple different subject areas of that. So I brought in an expert. I brought in Jason Dennis from Griff Insurance. So welcome to the show, sir. Great. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to be so here. So I'm sorry I made fun of your whole the whole profession being boring, but I, <laughs> well, but insurance to me, man, I, I hate dealing with it. Right. And I'm glad I have a great HR department here to help us out and everything. Uh, but why don't you give a little background about you? Like how long have you been around this industry and sure. and what do you do now? Sure. Uh, so I, I've been in this business now since 2003 and uh, kind of got into it more uh, out of a desire to... to to find a, a great way to earn a living and and help people. So I started out on the carrier side, uh, basically uh, for United Healthcare. Uh, if everyone is familiar with them, they're a very large uh, health insurance company owned by United Health Group. Um, basically got into underwriting training, uh, went to uh, a school, essentially we called it group school for about six months and uh, learned uh, underwriting uh, services, products and so forth, uh, risk, how to manage risk and, and those things. And I did that for uh, about 10 years. And then um, going on about seven years, I've been at McGriff Insurance Services, formerly BB&T, and, and really wanted to take what I knew from the carrier side and, and that experience and find ways to help employers um, save money, essentially. So when people ask me what I do, it's if, if I were to explain it in great detail, they probably would get bored. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what really the bottom line is, is I, I try and take, uh, what I know and what I've learned throughout the years to, to save employers money and, and help them build a, uh, hopefully a, a smarter program that, that, uh, is, is sustainable for the long term. Well, let's talk about two sides of the insurance. There's the whole property and casualty side, I believe mm-hmm. is the terminology. And then there's the, the healthcare and benefits side mm-hmm. for, for businesses like ours. So sure. let's talk about the healthcare side of it for a second. Okay. Let's go, let's go there first. Um, so, you know, I think I'm a good example of a lot of people out there. I was in my garage and dining room table five years ago, you know, and the business just grew and I knew nothing at all about health insurance. Right. right? And I, all I knew is I was hiring employees and they're asking during the interview, do you have, do you have health insurance? I'm like, not right now. Right. right? Um, and this is kind of, this is the Obama days really when I, mm-hmm. when I started this thing pre pre Trump. Right. So mm-hmm. I kind of knew Obamacare, but I, you know, you go on the internet and try to Google healthcare insurance, it's, it's a landmine out there of, of all kinds of information. Um, so what are some of the basic one-on-one things that if you're a small business owner and you don't have insurance today for your employees, first of all, why, why should you get it? And what are, what are some like real basic first steps somebody should do when they start heading down that path? Sure. That's a, that's a great question. And there's, I think a lot of dimensions there to, to, to address. Uh, if I'm starting a business and I'm looking at just the employee benefits, uh, for example, um, the first thing I want to do is work with a, a reputable advisor. And it, you know, everyone says this is a relationship business and, and what I do, and really not just what I do, but with, with most of us. You, you want to work with someone that you can trust, um, where you can have uh, a, a trusted advisor relationship. And I think really that starts with uh, someone that has a, a genuine interest in your business, kind of uh, how you, where you've been, where you're going, where you're trying to go. And ultimately, you want to hear about a process. Uh, and the process being, you know, this is our effective date, and we'll just use the next, uh, the, the, the coming month of July the 1st, uh, 7-1. Um, so that's really two months away, essentially. But um what you want to hear is, okay, this is, this is where we start. This is open enrollment. This is um, immediately after open enrollment. This is our quarterly checkups. You, know, you want to make sure that there's a process in place. Otherwise, you're always going to be chasing a renewal number late in the game, and you're not going to be able to really budget uh, for the coming, uh, the coming months because of the, the growth of, of, of cost of healthcare. So if I'm trying to find someone, do I just go on Google and find insurance advisor, my city name, or is there, is there certain 
certificates or experience that I should be looking for for somebody, you know, in that regard or get a referral from another business owner maybe? What's the yeah. what's the best way you would you would go forward? Yeah, a great again, a great way to do it is is a referral from uh, someone that you know and trust. Uh, in, in the business community, um, someone that, um, that, you know, runs a successful operation, uh, maybe they can give you a couple names and, and work, work that way. So what role does an advisor play in this whole thing? It, you know, why can't I just go, my ball is why can't I just go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and find health insurance mm-hmm. or go to, you know, I don't know what government websites are even out there anymore, but what, what, what role or what value do you guys provide in your services through this process? Well, there, there's a couple of things, really. It's uh, one, you, you, what you're paying an advisor for, one for one, is is access, access to the carriers, to their leadership, to um, maybe products that are specific, um, specifically offered through that agency. Um, so, so a big thing that you're paying for is access um, to, uh, again, just the leadership of a carrier, uh, programs, services, and then also. Uh, you're you're paying that advisor for their experience. I tell my wife all the time, I I don't get on thirty foot ladders. Okay, yeah. So I hire a roofer because they know how to install a roof, which we just did, and um, we actually hired the wrong one, um, and we had to redo the job. Mm. Um, so I didn't do that. That that falls on me because I didn't do my due diligence to learn a little bit more about that roofer and their practices. And we hired an, a second one who came and did the right job, but I don't get up on that roof and uh, and, and nail down shingles. So uh, you're, you're paying them for their skill and their ability. Well, I mean, we do use you now, but we mm-hmm. didn't use you before. Mm-hmm. And we have a vice president of HR, and I, you know, I didn't have that a year ago, right? So that's a new mm-hmm. role for us here. But that was one of the big problems he had was we knew our renewal was coming up at the end of last year. Mm-hmm. And usually there's a pretty big runway you have and a lot of deadlines and things you have to do in time in order to make that a a seamless thing that happens and have Mm -hmm. the time to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. And they really dropped the ball on it. They, Mm -hmm. they, they didn't do any of that. They didn't plan with us. They didn't communicate well. They didn't give us a good roadmap. And, uh, Charlie's our VP of HR and he's pretty much Mm -hmm. like, they're, they're out of here. We need to, we need to go find someone Mm -hmm. else. So we were, you know, fortunate enough to find you through that whole process. So I do agree having good, uh, vendors, you know, as a business owner, you're a vendor, right? Mm -hmm. So it's great to have good vendors that you can trust and give you good information and right. are, are with you to help build your business, not just there to go chase that bill and then go right. chase that renewal every single year. Right. So right. I totally agree. So here's the question about health insurance. Mm-hmm. So if inflation is only 2 or 3% a year, why do insurance premiums seem to go up much more than that every single year? Uh, that's another uh, Fantastic question. Um, you know, when, when a carrier uh, on a fully insured um, side of the house or self-funded where you may have stop loss that, that covers some of your larger losses, there, there's this little thing called trend. And you have pharmacy and, and medical trend, and usually they combine the two. Pharmacy trend today is, is quickly outpacing medical trend. And trend simply is just uh, this service is not what it cost 12 months ago. And that is because of a lot of things, um, technological advances, um, the, the cost of goods, um, you know, MRI machines are, are more and more expensive every year. And when you get into to pharmacy, they're, with the advent of specialty medications, um, they're growing um, live cells to create uh, a treatment for cystic fibrosis, um, cancer, uh, you, you name these, these very expensive diseases. Those are all con- uh, contributors to um, the cost of healthcare. So, so when we go for a renewal every year, are you guys looking at, oh, diesel laptops, they paid in X dollars, they, we, we paid out Y dollars, we, we were over, now we got to go charge them more than the other customer? Is it individual or do they just kind of look at the group, like you said, in a, in a bigger aspect? Or how do, how do they come up with that? Yeah, so an- another great question. So usually it's, it's based on um, a, a table. So if you're under 500 members and members are employees plus dependents. So if, if I've got a family of seven and, and you're single, Tyler, yeah. we're now eight members in this company. Okay. So uh, diesel laptops is of a size, for example, where you're just under a hundred on the plan. And so I don't, I don't get to see claims data, um, which isn't as fun for me uh, because I want to see really the, the reality of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, you're, you, you would be, you know, once you get over that threshold, you would be probably uh, 20 to 25% credible with your claims. 
uh, 500 or more members usually is 100% credible for their claims. What, what does credible mean? Uh, meaning, so there's a blend of a manual rate okay. and, and your actual claims experience. Okay. So the manual rate, when, when we get a census, we're looking at uh, the zip code where the employee lives, the age or date of birth, um, the gender. Uh, those things are very important because, you know, to break it down simply, older females typically are much more healthy than older males. Yep. Um, we tend to ignore our health as men when we're younger, <laughs> uh, may have one too many beers from time to time and, and don't check in with our doctor. Yeah. Um, and so, so as we age, we tend to be more unhealthy. And, you, you know, conversely, women, when they're younger, they're having children. So. You, you know, I think you hit me to a T. I don't think I've been actually been to a doctor in about a year or not. I'm sorry, about a decade. It's It's been right. a while since I actually went in because I'm like, oh, I feel fine. I don't feel like going in for my checkups. I, I probably should. I'm hitting, I'm in my mid forties now. It's probably an important thing right. I need to do. So all those factors contribute to what they call a manual rate. And okay. that, that manual rate is really, it's sort of like a, an experiment in socialism, sort of, in that they're looking at this pool of people within these zip codes. and uh, you may have a higher prevalence for stroke in South Carolina than you might would in the state of Iowa. There may there may be a higher rate of um, different types of cancer in Iowa than there is in South Carolina. So they, they take that and they make that uh, really kind of a, not really a predictor, but sort of. Um, they can get a good feel for how your claims are going to run with yeah. that manual rate. So it sounds like these insurance companies have some pretty advanced analytical systems and a lot of data points and a lot of smart people just really trying to figure out if we pay, if they collect X, we need to pay out a little bit less than that, right? They're in, they're in the business to make money at the end of the day. Correct. Yeah. And, and so, and then you have different carriers. So um, United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, they're publicly traded. Uh, Blue Cross of, of South Carolina, for example, is not. And so they come at it from a different angle. Uh, both great carriers just yeah. coming at it from different angles. Um, some, you know, something that, that always kind of blows my mind is the second largest database in the world. I think it is, is owned by United health group. And basically if you're a smaller employer, let's say you are, uh, 30 employees, we would get, uh, your census with your gender or not, not your gender if you're under 50, but your, your date of birth, your zip code and your name. Uh, for employees and dependents, and they can look up your pharmacy, your pharmacy history. Wow, which is is pretty interesting, yeah, and sort of spooky at the same <laughs> time. But but um, they they need this data in order to to come up with uh, a number, and uh, the number uh, which is comforting to me is not just pulled out of thin air. It's used so that they can make a reasonable profit, and uh, the employer has a sustainable healthcare program. So at the end of the day, what I'm kind of hearing is the, the younger, more healthy your, your employees are and their family, you typically get a better rate then once you hit a certain size. Is that generally true or am I, am I off base there? You no, know, I mean, you're, you, yeah. I mean, so in the, in the two to 50 space, two to 50 eligible employees, yeah. um, that, that was really uh, what uh, hit a lot of employers differently in that your claims experience means absolutely nothing in the two to 50 space. You get a metallic rate. It's off the shelf. It's filed with the state. You take that rate and you run with it. And it's all age banded. Okay. And so, yes, the, the rates for a younger group um, in the 250 space, they're going to be much lower because they're age banded. Uh, whereas if you're in 51 to 100 and, and beyond, um, your claims experience becomes a little bit more important. Um, yes, you're, the older you get, you tend to have more uh, sicknesses. And so and so forth. So um, the underwriting changes as you grow in size. Okay. And, and once we, you know, for a group like yours, once we kind of get into that that claims experience, then I'll be able to come out and talk to you more about sort of here's what's going on, you know, and here here are some of your top conditions, and here's some things we can do to tweak the plan and address those issues. Yeah. All right. So you know, let's talk about one of the one of the things that's out there now, right? Mm -hmm. COVID nineteen, coronavirus, mm -hmm. whatever whatever you want to call it. You know, that's obviously the news. A lot of people are getting sick. A lot of people are dying. Do you see a big impact in that hitting the insurance company rates next year or this year even? I know a couple, a couple, I think out West, maybe it was Washington State or something, just came out with their rate increase in a couple other areas. And they really weren't that out of line compared to what they normally have been historically. Mm -hmm. So what, where do you think that's going or what do you, what do you see? You're on the, you're on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, you asked me that question kind of before we get we get started too, and, and that, that's a great one. Um, what what is this going to look like in terms of of our cost? I, I 
the immediate future, I don't, I don't, you know, the carriers have done a great job in, in reacting to this. You know, a lot of them are waiving copays, waiving costs related to uh, COVID. They're, they're actually allowing for uh, mid-year open enrollments. In fact, the IRS is opening up for, uh, to that as well. So they've reacted very well uh, across the board. In terms of cost, I haven't really seen anything with the larger self-funded groups in the stop-loss markets where I've seen any kind of panic or, or reaction to that. I think the data is so new, it's kind of hard to say. Um, but by and large, um, I, I, from everything I'm seeing is it's been pretty flat. Yeah. It's been pretty flat. All right. So you're, you're a business owner, small business, right? Our size-ish, smaller. And you get that, you know, paper slid across your desk at the end of the year and you, you find out your rates went up double digits or went up something more than you were expecting. Mm-hmm. What, is there any options for a business at that point? Is there anything they can do in, in that situation or is it just kind of grin and bear it and try to, try to figure it out for next year? Well, uh, you know, and, and with everybody, I, I have, you know, clients that, that see a, a very low single digit increase <laughs> sub pharmacy yeah. and medical trend and they, they get nervous and, and want to make some immediate changes. What we're really looking for is in underwriting, there's a, there's a cycle, you know, just like in our physical health, um, we may be very healthy for four years. And then the fifth year, um, you go in, you have a couple surgeries and all of a sudden you're showing up on a large claim report yeah. and then you're back to normal. Um, what we really look for is kind of that, that happy ground of, uh, what, what does it look like over the years? So I think if you, you know, if you make a habit of jumping carriers every single year, it, it hurts the employer uh, in that they 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 gain a reputation in the market for for kind of jumping over rate, and underwriters tend to get less aggressive when it, when um, when you ha- develop a pattern of sort of jumping over over a rate, and so part of my job as an advisor is to to work with employer groups and and whatever advisor the people out there uh, choose to work with is to see what is sustainable and, and what 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 your budget can afford and what makes sense. Does it, because there's a cost to jumping carriers every year. You have to mm-hmm. pull your employees off the line, do open enrollment meetings and HR gets noise over different pharmacy drug lists and, and those sorts of things. Um, so, you know, the, I'm not sure there is a, a true recipe for when to make a change or, or what to do, but if you do get that big increase, one, it, it really shouldn't come as a surprise. Yep. You know, your, your advisor should, um, should be talking to you about trends in the market throughout the year um, and sort of helping you understand uh, what your options are early on as opposed to uh, me bringing a, a bag of peanuts into your office and sliding a 30% renewal across the <laughs> table. That's not a good thing to do. Um, so it, it really depends on kind of what your needs are, but, but you can flex to high deductible health plans. Um, I, I'm a big fan of those. Um, you kind of get the the triple threat of tax savings of of um, pre tax dollars going in, uh, dollars growing tax deferred, and then uh, you can pull money out tax free for your health care. Um, so, and then you couple those with things like hospital indemnity plans, which cost ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a month to help people uh, from uh, becoming broke over uh, a major event. Yeah, and I've seen things to do with the high deductible. My last employer, it was a high deductible, right, ten thousand. Yeah. But you'd bring your receipt in, and they would re they would refund you back to help offset some of that. And there's there's things that can be done mm. um, along those lines. So we have a health savings account here, right, mm-hmm. in HSA. And I was talking to one of our HR people. They said there's very few people in our company that are even enrolled in the HSA account, mm-hmm. and it's a tax free thing, right, to save people money. Is that typical? Do you see other companies not really utilizing it fully, or is it is it all over the board? Well, I, I, you know, I think um, one one thing that we've been working on since um, uh, y'all were kind enough to hire us is education. Yeah, and it's it's sort of a process. It, it doesn't happen overnight. Most employers typically have very low participation in high deductible health plans, uh, but the more people understand them and and know that there are tools available for them to you know with price transparency to kind of know uh, this hospital over here is going to charge two thousand dollars for an MRI. If I cross the street to a freestanding facility, I may pay four hundred dollars for that same MRI. Yep. And so there are tools available to employees to to help them find a lower cost. They also need to understand the tax savings and the benefits of of those benefits offered to them. Uh, and then you know 
you have to educate them on some other uh, ways to help offset costs. Um, but y- you can eventually see a growth and participation in health savings accounts, but it's slow. Yeah. I mean, the whole healthcare industry to the, to the average person and average worker, it's, it's a complicated thing. There are a lot of variables and in-network and out-of-network and deductibles and co-insurances and co- yeah. like it, it's, it's hard to understand all that stuff. And you go through it once a year through an HR talk or yep. a little lecture and, then you get you forget about it until nine months later, someone in your family's sick or needs right. an emergency ER visit or a, a ambulance needs to show up, and all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, who do I who do I need to call? Who do I need to deal with? So it is an important thing though. It affects a lot of people out there at companies, and they need to be educated. They do. Uh, e- education is probably the, the most uh, key employee benefit that you can offer. Is you can offer uh, a whole bunch of benefits, but unless people understand how they fit together and how the pieces work. You're kind of just throwing a whole mishmash of product that costs you, the employer, a bunch of money and uh, the employee a bunch of money. And they often go un- underutilized or unused uh, just because people don't don't know. Yeah. And and really, that's incumbent on us, the advisor, to uh, work with your employees and, and uh, work out a, a way to provide a, a better education, educational experience. So one of the things that surprised me is I held off on getting health insurance for a while. I, I think I finally had to get it at like 50 employees. There's a number yep. we hit eventually. Was it yep. 50? Is that Over it? Yeah. 50. Over 50, yeah. yeah. Right. And, you know, at the time I had a CFO and everything and he kind of did the whole thing. I, I didn't have a VP of HR. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I grew up and you hear all this stuff on the news, how expensive it is, how much it's going to cost you. And I used to work for someone else and they would always tell us how, how expensive it was. Right. But when I when I really did it, it really it really wasn't as bad as I as I thought it would be. So I don't know if the bar got set so <laughs> so high or so low there that right. it was easy. But it, it really wasn't a huge watershed moment where I'm like I'm gonna go broke and paying health insurance for my employees. Do you do you find people are sometimes surprised on what it costs, either to the good or the bad, or do most people have a general sense when you talk to other business owners? Um, yeah, you know, it's it really. I mean, you know, some employers, you know, are shocked at the cost. Um, so, some, you know, just understand that, that, that comes with the territory and it, I think what the, the way, the way you need to look at it is, um, I'm offering something that, that is going to contribute. It, it will also contribute to your bottom line, uh, keeping a healthy staff, keeping people, uh, physically well and mentally well, keeps them engaged in your business and contributing to your bottom line. Um, it, it, it it's just a, the, the trouble with healthcare is it, it, it is, it is not cheap. Um, you know, uh, so there is a, there is a pretty hefty price tag with health insurance. So do you think now with COVID happening, people not wanting to travel and go out and do things, do you see, you know, telemedicine's kind of something you see now, right? Mm-hmm. You get your doctor on your phone or your computer or yep. whatever it is, and they're able to do a remote, you know, diagnostics essentially right on right. you and, and help you out. Yeah. Do you see that being a bigger thing now or people trying to, or maybe people trying to be like, Hey, that's a better solution than me having to go to the hospital where there's a bunch of other sick people, sick people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, telehealth is something that is growing, um, by leaps and bounds. I mean, if you look at the stock of, you know, some of these, uh, telehealth companies that uh, over this coronavirus uh, recently have, has just exploded. And, um, I, I use it often. Um, we, we were on vacation a few years ago and I hadn't had any earache since I was four years old. And some, for some reason I got one a couple of years ago and I, I used telehealth by the pool and, um, down in Florida and within 45 minutes we went to Walgreens. I got some drops, some pills and vacation wasn't interrupted. It was awesome. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, and, and employers, that's something employers really need to help, uh, promote, educate, 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 educate your employees on you it. Got yep. it. You yep. got it. I mean, and, uh, I've got some where we, you know, the, for the larger self-funded uh, accounts that I have, we made it free. Uh, and we still didn't see a whole lot of utilization. So we decided to do an all out campaign with some of these to really push, uh, the value of telehealth and uh, employers really started to see, I mean, shoot, uh, once an employee realizes I don't have to take four hours out of my day to go to a primary care physician. I can just go and, and sit in a quiet corner of the office and make a quick call and, and pick up my medication on the way home. That's a huge time saver for the employee. Yep. The guy or gal that's uh, making uh, an hourly wage doesn't have to take time off to, uh, to go to the doctor. And the employer is seeing that um, I've got people that are at work and, and doing what they need to do instead of burning up time chasing a physician. So yep. And it's lower cost. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you 100%. You know, personally, I'm not... 
you know, if I happen to catch COVID-19, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm just, I'd rather not be sick and have to go deal with it. Right. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, let me go. If I can avoid going to a doctor's office or I can get DoorDash deliver me my groceries or whatever right. it is, like I'm, I'm all for it at this, at this point in time. So right. I, I do think, and I hear politicians talking about it a lot too, right? Like, Hey, let's, why aren't more people doing this? This is much better than people having to go drive to the local clinic or dock right. in a box or whatever it is for and a lot of that stuff you can, you can do over the phone with, right. with doctors. So it's really great to see that new technology. Um, I think that really comes out a lot now, yep. post COVID or in the middle of COVID, whatever whatever that area is that we're in currently. Yeah, and and you know, uh, give you an idea. Um, typical, uh, if you were to pay cash for um, a, a telehealth visit, be you know forty nine to fifty nine dollars in that range. Um, your, your average cost for a PCP in South Carolina and Columbia is anywhere from eighty five to one hundred and ten dollars. So there's a savings there. Yeah. It's not huge, but 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 little things make big things. Well, I I would actually probably pay more just so I don't have to drive there and, yeah, and go right. deal with it and waste a couple hours of my day. Right. Right. So, right. so. yeah, that's no, it's good to hear. So let's let's touch a little bit on the on the other side. And I know it's not your forte at all. Right. But I'm sorry, property and casualty is property that property casualty. Yeah. Yep. So I was on your website earlier. I mean, you guys listed out all kinds of things here, right? Commercial flood, commercial liability, commercial property, cyber liability, professional liability, small business. I mean, there's, yeah. there, there's a, there's a whole buffet of different yeah. insurance options that are out there. Mm -hmm. So if you had to boil this down to, you know, again, that small business owner that mm -hmm. runs a repair shop, he's got, you know, a dozen technicians. What are some of the one-on-one insurance coverages that he should have on, on that side of the equation to make sure his, his business isn't um, you know, I, I'm thinking that guy doesn't want to fix a truck and have it leave his shop and go hit a school bus and right. kill a bunch of kids, right? Like that'd be right. that'd be a bad situation to be in, right? Um, um, or a truck falls on somebody that's working on one, right? Absolutely, right. So what what are what are some of the things that those that industry should look at? Um, I mean, everybody, and again, let me preface this again by saying I, I'm very very high level when it comes to <laughs> to uh, work uh, uh, property casualty insurance. But, um, you know, workers comp, of course, you know, employee gets injured on the job. You, you got to have uh, workers comp coverage for those folks. Um, auto. So if you have um, automobiles, you want to make sure you have coverage for automobiles. Um, general liability. Um, the You know, general liability covers a lot of things um, when it comes to um, uh, poor workmanship or, or perceived poor workmanship. It can cover um, a lot of things where, you know, like you had just mentioned, I believe that's one of them where, you know, if, if someone does work in, in the auto body shop and the car runs off the road and it, it's tied back to you, then you need to have coverage for those things. Uh, if you're, if you're operating an online presence, um, one thing I hear from our property casualty guys all the time is cyber liability. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, um, uh, criminal activities um, uh, going on out there, going on out there on, in the online world. So uh, I'm going to share a couple stories here to the listeners okay. and watchers here on, on, on the cybersecurity thing. And I think a lot of times people don't think it's real or think it happens to like yeah. these big, huge mega corporations. Yeah. So two years ago, we were selling on Amazon, right? So you sell on Amazon, you send stuff to them, mm -hmm. and then Amazon ships their customers. And every two weeks, you get a money deposit into your bank account mm -hmm. from Amazon. Well, some hacker got into one of the computers at our office and it happened to be someone that had access to change the bank account information on our Amazon deposit. So the person went in there, changed the, changed the bank account to some other bank somewhere. And when that every other week happened, when we're supposed to get our, our deposit from Amazon, it never showed up. And it took us like another week to figure it out. We thought, oh, it's a white, it's an ACH. It takes some time sometimes. And come to find out, it was a hacker that got one of our systems compromised. We got compromised. And I had $44,000 diverted from Amazon, you know, from my bank account to somewhere else. And at the end of the day, we talked to a lot of people and nobody, we filed a local police report. One of the neighbors in my neighborhood actually works for the FBI. And there's only like a dozen FBI agents in the whole state. He's just pretty much like, man, it's the new, it's the new bank robbery. Yeah. <laughs> it's so frequent. And it honestly goes, that's a low dollar amount. No mm -hmm. one's going to care. Right. And he was absolutely right. Nobody, nobody did care. And then we have credit card fraud that happens to us all the time. Um, we've had other people here at our company forge my signature on checks and wow. deposit them into their own account. And we, we've had all kinds of things happen. And you'd be, I think the general public would be amazed at how many ways there are to steal from a business owner, especially when you're inside that business and understand how it works. Mm -hmm. 
And the cyber liability stuff is a is a huge deal to yep. anybody. And they really should strongly look into it and find out what it costs and, and what it protects you on. Because um, And it's not just money stolen. It's, I believe, theft protection. And if your systems are compromised and, mm-hmm. and other things that happen along those lines. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, going back to uh, employee benefits, you're, you're taking uh, pennies or nickels and you're insuring dollars. Yep. And, um, and big dollars. Um, you know, so... So it is a worthwhile uh, endeavor to look at cyber security coverage, um, business interruption insurance. Um, so I remember the first time we were doing a trade show and the trade show company calls us, goes, oh, we need a certificate of liability coverage or certificate. I, I can't remember the exact terminology. And they're like, it needs to be at least $2 million. You know, I'm in my garage and dining room table, right? And I'm like, right. oh my God, $2 million. Like, right. <laughs> I can't afford that. And Again, going back to that time, it, it really wasn't that bad to have that liability coverage based on what we do as a company. So right. even though you're getting millions of dollars in coverage, it, it doesn't cost you all no. that much at the end of the day. No, it really doesn't. It's 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 a, like I said, it's it's a worthwhile endeavor to to um, look at those things. Now with coronavirus, there are some things that are impacting the workers' comp uh, uh, world and the business interruption. Um, I, you know, uh, with workers' comp, I think the state of California is starting to. Um, has set some precedent, which usually when that happens there and, and in New York, it tends to work its way down and into the country. Um, and I think a few other states have done this where it's the burden of proof is going to be on the employer to prove that the employee didn't get sick uh, relative to something mm-hmm. at the employer's um, side of business. And so um, I think you'll see on the property casualty side, and again, this is coming from a novice who listens to his property casualty experts. Um, you're going to see some changes there, um, I think over time, and I don't really know what that looks like, but it doesn't, it doesn't always sound like uh, it's going to be in favor of, of the employer. So, yeah, you important. know, it's crazy. You know, you're starting to see all the lawsuits now in this whole coronavirus thing, mainly on the state government level with people mm-hmm. trying to fight back to lock down states or their rights being taken away. Mm-hmm. But I can see that totally shifting to the business side before long where, well, my employer made me come to work and I got right. sick. And Correct. then. Another employee says, well, you made that person come and I got sick and my grandfather died because right. I got them sick. Now, you know, I, right. this thing can get really ugly really quick without some real government intervention in, in trying to figure it all out because the virus is here and we it's can't here. 100% protect ourselves from it 24-7. It's just not something yeah. that can happen, right? So right. it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Yeah, and, and that brings me to kind of uh, another point about when you're choosing an advisor. And that's why I, I work with um, the, the place I work is we have an outstanding group of property casualty guys and there are lots of shops that do as well. Yeah. And what, what I tell employers to look for is, is a, a shop that has a very good uh, property casualty and employee benefits department because those two areas overlap all the time, yep. all the time. And so when you're out there looking for advisors, um, a, a good thing to, to consider is what, what does the other side of the house look like too? So, so maybe a red flag is if a guy comes to you and says, Hey, I know all my, ins- I know, I know both sides of this. I'm a one man show. I'm an expert on all these things. Maybe a red sign that you got the wrong, the wrong company working with you. Uh, uh, listen, I don't, I don't pro- proclaim to know it all, <laughs> but um, I know, uh, I know a lot about employee benefits and I don't have enough uh, brain power to do both. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's, that's probably a, a very good statement. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Janice, we're kind of we're kind of coming up on our on our whole time here. Uh, what what do I miss? Anything important I should have talked about that we didn't that we didn't kind of cover? No, I think I think you did a great job. Uh, you know, relative to coronavirus, there's um, you know there have been changes, um, but I think the 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 theme here is to is for people not to panic. And uh, when when we're looking for advisors and we're looking for coverage, uh, the only advice I'd give is is to when you, when you hire someone, you trust them and. You let them do the work that that they they're good at doing, and help let them guide you uh, through that. And if they're not engaging you to do that, that that may be a problem. You know, I, I think I learned a while back. Now I need to have some great partners around me, not just employees, but mm-hmm. I need to have great bankers around me, great mm-hmm. financial advisors, great tax people, great people that understand the whole insurance system. Because right. so it's really hard to manage your business unless you got a lot of people that are highly knowledgeable that can really give you the right facts. Correct. Right on everything, and that's really what comes. There's there's opinions and facts, and you got to distinguish the two sometimes uh, through that whole thing. So, with that said, uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely, thank you. If we got some, I, I know you're kind of you're kind of regional, I guess your your role or what? How big yeah, how big is McGriff? Uh, McGriff is the 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 fifth largest um, consulting firm in the United States. Uh, we you know obviously work with uh, uh, property casualty employee benefits. 
Uh, we have a, a big footprint on the, the East Coast, and um, we're growing throughout the country. Uh, we've got operations out West and in the Midwest and, and here in uh, the East Coast. So if someone wants to get a hold of McGriff, how do they do that? And if someone wants to get a hold of you personally, is it LinkedIn, email? What's 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 sure. the best contacts here? Uh, the best way to to um, look us up is uh, McGriffInsurance.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn um, just under Jason Dennis and uh, my work email. You can even email me there if you just have general questions. Um is J D E N N I S at McGriff insurance.com. Great. I'm going to sign up every spam list I know about now. So no, I'm just kidding. All right. Well, Jason, very much. I really appreciate you coming on. I really appreciate you educating everybody. Hopefully everyone learned a little bit of everything. People have questions. They can definitely reach out to you and, and McGriff. So again, thank you for coming on the show. It Enjoy. is very much appreciated. No, thank you. Enjoy. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for another great episode. Hopefully you'll learn something here and uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks.